and that that collection event of events is curved. That is what Einstein's theory is telling you. Not just the space part, but the space time together is curved. It's a little difficult to think, but basically what he's saying is that to ho what is this whole world? It's a collection of events. The initial events and the final events <coughs> must match smoothly. <coughs> now, if you can kill your grandfather, it means they are not matching smoothly. <laughs> right? So therefore you cannot have such a world. So Einstein's theory tells you, you cannot kill your grandfather, you will always miss him if you fire. <laughs> it's impossible to kill your grandfather. If the guy killed the huh? enemy of the grandfather. Enemy of the grandfather. That's okay. <laughs> well, this is very nice, isn't it? Very beautiful, very nice. You don't have to really know a lot of mathematics to understand this. But at the same time, it involves a lot of abstract thinking because you are thinking of a surface which is a surface of events. So that is immediately is a mathematical abstraction. And you have to use such mathematical abstraction to do physics. Because physics has to be true generally. So if you are only dealing with particulars, that's not science, that's not physics. You have to deal with generalities, which means you have to abstract. That's it. So what time is it now? 4.45. Do you want to ask questions or do you want to see a little bit of Einstein's life? My question is the, about the, the, I mean the Kant. I'm going to kind of talk about the two truths. Two kinds of truths. Two kinds of truths. And, and the one is the, the, the scientific a priori. Hmm? A priori, yeah. The analytical truths, which are true by definition, yeah. Hmm? Naya Yaka. Naya, Naya, Naya Yaka's. Uh, the Naya, Naya talk about the inference. So give you an example. When we, when we, when we no. saw the smoke on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. We, so we, that is, a fire. that is, uh, they have a fourth, fourth, fourth position, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, position in addition to the three Aristotelian ones. Yeah. yeah. My question is that the, according to the blind man, he did you get an experience? Huh? Blind, blind, blind man. Blind man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, according to a blind man, blind man, he did you get an experience of the uh, small thing? No, he can. How do you know he doesn't have experience? I, we can. We have now evidence to show that blind people can also see, but not in our way. He can't see, but he can touch the fire. <coughs> Nor can you. Then can he come to know that this is the fire? No, but, but he, he can, but he can get it from. But he can feel the heat. Yeah, he can feel the heat. Yeah. But he can't see the. No, but but his his colleague will tell him there is a fire. So that is not a good argument in this context. <laughs> Seeing is not the only way to know that there is something. You can feel it, you can, you can hear about it. There is so much you know today which you have never seen or heard or touched or felt. But you know it's there because so many people are telling you. Supposing there is fire in New York. Now, how will you know? You can, somebody can read a newspaper and tell you, and you'll believe it, because you'll get a phone call from a friend saying, oh God, there's fire here. Will you believe it or not? So being blind is not a, 
important fact. Mm. Mm, my question is that, sir, mm, at first you said that uh, um, Newton's some theories was proved wrong by Einstein, Einstein and, uh, and, and soon the Einstein's theories are also going to, uh, going to be proved wrong in the future. Uh, you said that if I'm not wrong, so I said that there is every possibility, every possibility. yes, yeah, so and there already are indications. That, yeah, so hmm. my question is that from uh, which point you uh, you see that that in the view, in the coming stage the Einstein theory is going to be proved wrong possibilities. I mean, and the, from the um, and you talk about also two truths, uh, two truths, and from the Buddhist philosophy, the the final ultimate truth is that the the um, uh, all the uh, phenomena are interdependent. Interdependent, I think you call it the point. From which theory? Uh, or, or Buddhist, Buddhist point. Yes. Or, or the ultimate truth is that all the phenomena are interdependent. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Yeah, to answer the second question, I, I think what, that is correct. But uh, not because Buddhists are telling me, but because physics and science is also pointing towards that. And it makes sense. I mean, if everything is not dependent on everything, then... I mean, yeah, everything has to depend on everything. But in exactly what way is the important question. Everybody knows that, that everything depends on everything in some way. But sometimes these dependencies are not obvious at all. Right? I mean, uh, your existence and my existence do not seem to be immediately connected. I cannot say that because I am, you are. But in some way, somewhere, it, we may be connected. So, these general statements are fine, and we can believe them. But how exactly that is... Uh, that works in a particular case, we do not know. And the business of science is to find that out. So we are very far away from there, but there are indications. Okay, and uh, so this one thing, the first question is how, why do I say? Well, you shouldn't give too much t uh, importance to what I say. No, okay. The yeah, I know. Yeah, but let me first that say that I, let me first warn you that you must not take me too seriously. <laughs> Number one. Number two is, yes, now that you have asked me, I'll tell you. But I don't think I can tell you now. Maybe towards the end of the lectures, if you remind me, then I'll tell you. And because by that time, you will also know why I'm telling you. So wait a little. There are many more things to come which will show why, why I am saying this. But I don't know exactly how that will happen. Nobody knows. Because if you knew, you would do it immediately and get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Paradox. Oh, yeah. there is a, there is a, a small um, cartoon. Can we show that? Sixty Second Adventures in Thought Number Two The Grandfather Paradox Will time travel ever be possible? René Barjavel was a French journalist and science fiction writer who spent a lot of his time thinking about time travel. In 1943, Barjavel asked what would happen if a man went back in time to a date before his parents were born and killed his own grandfather. With no grandfather, one of the man's parents would never have been born and therefore the man himself would never have existed. So there would be nobody to go back in time and kill the grandfather in the first place, or the last place, depending on how you look at it. The grandfather paradox has been a mainstay of philosophy, physics, and the entire Back to the Future trilogy. Some people have tried to defend time travel with arguments like the parallel universe resolution, in which the changes made by the time traveler create a new separate history branching off from the existing one. But the grandfather paradox prevails. Although the paradox only suggests that travelling backwards in time is impossible. It doesn't say anything about going the other way. The, uh, and the, the, so, and, uh, 
the problem is that the, the we can the one cannot kill the uh, grandfather because that's the logic. If you could kill the then you the won't be uh, you won't exist. Yeah. The killer will not be exist, right? So that's in the normal world that we know. Yes, yeah, but if you have a Goedelian universe, which is possible in if general relativity is correct and it is correct. So there are things like I don't know these things very well, but you can read up wormholes. So you can through wormholes you can disappear into the past. But these wormholes, uh, yeah. I mean, if you apparent, I haven't seen, but if you have seen uh, this new f movie they have made uh, called hmm? Action, Action Replay. <laughs> No, not that one. It's a, <laughs> it's a Hollywood movie called. Uh, hmm? No, no, that's the Avatar. Huh? No, 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 no. It's it's called. Uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, it's a very famous film now being talked about. Anyway, they, are, they, they show what happens if you have… It's, it's not a science movie, it's a, it's a feature film which has a lot of science in it. Uh, what is it called? Age of Tomorrow. Hmm? Age of Tomorrow. No, no, no. Who is the actor? Who is the actor? I never <laughs> know actors, modern actors, I don't know. I, I live in the days of… Very old actors. Uh, what is it called? Anyway, so a great uh, physicist, Kip Thorne, is the advisor in that film. Can you go back? Is possible or impossible? Huh? Sorry? Time, time traveling back, is, is it possible? Well, the grandfather paradox says no. Because that's the, it will end up with logical fallacies. Logically, it is not possible. But this is logic in the normal sense. But if you go to a Guedelian, Einsteinian Guedelian universe where the whole geometry is different and so on, then it seems to be possible B without a logical fallacy. Now there are two things. One is in principle whether it is followed. We are only talking about in principle. To actually go back in time will require technology and so on, which we are not talking about. Hmm? Because you have to travel very fast. Not only travel very fast, but accelerate very fast, which will require such energy, we will never get it. You should. I mean, if such a universe exists, you just cannot. Yeah, because the two surfaces have to meet smoothly. This argument is very nice. The smooth means so that the 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 past surface of events must smoothly meet the future surface of events. That means there cannot be any contradiction between the two. So you cannot kill your grandfather. Because so that, that means uh, that the, the person who uh, cannot the, meet the grandfather. He can meet it, meet him, but he, he can shake hands, he can have a meal together, but he, <laughs> he can even embrace but cannot kill him. So what the difference between the killing and the. Uh, killing means. Yeah. This, it's not just killing the grandfather. No, you can kill the grandfather after your father is born. Then no problem. <laughs> but you have the question is: Can you kill him before your father was born? That would be an impossibility. Just meeting him is not a problem. The problem is before the killing. Before the birth of your grand of your father. Then he, then your father has cannot be born, you really? Then how are you born? So this is the problem. But you can kill him after your father is born, no problem. <laughs>
or even after you are born, no problem. You can't, well, how? In practical terms? Practically. Practically, it's impossible. It's all theoretical ideas. But if theoretically it is possible, one day man will achieve it. But maybe 200 years, 300 years from now, in some way, I don't know. But right now, there is no way. But why do you want to go back? <laughs> You want to go back to Buddha's time and hear him directly, <laughs> huh? in yeah. Sarnath. Yeah. Yes. They are, they, they are talking about the, the possibility of the collect the, uh, the, the very two thousand or five thousand. Huh? The collect this uh, a sound which is produced before two thousand or five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So if that is supposed to be... Yeah, I, you see, when I went to school, I went to a Catholic school, St. Xavier's in Calcutta. And that was way back in 1950, maybe before your father was born. <laughs> <laughs> then um, we were taught the Bible. And in Bible, there are two Bibles, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we began with the Old Testament with Genesis, you know, how the world was created, Adam and Eve, and then so on and so forth. And I got fascinated. I'm going to give a talk about this on the 21st in Kolkata. The books that have influenced me, that's the topic in Sahitya Academy. And I've decided to talk about the Bible, because it really did move me very much. Because it was a strange world. I, I was born in a ordinary Bengali Hindu family. Suddenly I go there and uh, at home we always spoke Bengali there. Everybody was speaking English and I found, found it difficult. Then all these new things, the Bible and so on came. It was very strange and all along the school walls there were little watercolor pictures of the Bible history, you know, various events. And I always thought this, uh, supposing I could go back and catch those sounds and then I can then ve know whether all this was true or not, or as the other telling me just some stories. So, but the point is that is not possible. <laughs> I can't go back, e even if I went back 2000 years ago, all that sound would have, dis have disappeared now, dissipated. So there's no way I can get it anymore. So the possibility is that the event produces sound, is that the, the reparation is all going, keep going. No, it can't. So I mean, if you believe in physics, that's the impossibility. Yeah, the it's just not possible. Practically, it's a very possible, impossible to collect that. Nowadays, you can because you can record it and keep it. <laughs> but in those days, you couldn't. <laughs> Not as vibrations as such, those you will dissipate, but you record it and keep that record and you keep it, transfer it to better and better media and you may be able to have it for a long time. We put it up in the cloud, it will remain, I mean iCloud. But in those days that was not possible. Today we can hear so many things that happened in the past, we can hear so and so's voice, Subhash Chandra Bose's voice, Gandhi's voice and so on, we can hear. But uh, in those days, what Buddha might have actually said is lost. It's just recorded, but the thoughts are, have been preserved. But even there, some transformation might have taken place in the understanding of the disciples. A lot of arguments after that. A lot of arguments. That's what I wanted. My my desire was to do that for the Bible, <laughs> which is 500 years later than Buddha. No, the Christ was born 500 years before, but this was before Buddha. Yeah. So today we will see a part of a movie on the life of. Albert Einstein.
Some people wonder, how did Einstein think? How do we physicists think? Most of it is when we're quiet, all by ourselves. We stare out the window and have blocks of equations just wandering in our head until these equations fit together. And then we get a sheet of paper and scribble. It can be very frustrating at times, scribbling equations everywhere. The old cliche of scribbling on the back of the envelope often is true, because that's sometimes all you have around. He was always thinking in pictures, visualizing things. When his father gave him a compass, he would just sit up night after night watching the needle point northward. It would send chills down his spine. Einstein once said, I want to know God's thoughts in a mathematical way. Einstein wanted an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that would encapsulate all physical laws. The beauty, the majesty, the power of the universe into a single equation. That was his life's goal. In 1900, Albert Einstein is a 21-year-old undergraduate at the Swiss Federal Polytechnic. That this young man will one day be synonymous with genius was something none of his professors would have predicted. He would cut class. The professors thought he was a goof-off. As a consequence, Einstein couldn't get a single job after graduation. He even thought about switching fields and selling insurance. Can you imagine opening the door one day and there's Albert Einstein selling you life insurance? What a waste. Einstein thought he was such a loser. He wrote a letter to his family saying that it would be better if perhaps he was never born. Nobody was talking about the young Albert Einstein. He worked as a substitute teacher in short jobs in various towns. Einstein's father tried to apply on behalf of Einstein for academic positions. And he wrote to a very famous professor and asked him whether he could use Einstein as a research assistant. But there were no positions available. His father passes away thinking that young Albert is a total disgrace to the family. In 1902, the depressed and despondent young Albert moves to Bern, Switzerland's capital, and begins a career far from science. One of his friends arranged for Einstein to get a job as a lowly patent clerk in the Swiss patent office. In this office, on the third floor, Einstein spends six days a week reviewing applications submitted by all kinds of inventors to the Swiss government. Given a patent, you had all this information, and he had to strip it down to the essence. And that honed his skills as a physicist. He would very quickly dash off all the patents that he had to analyze. He didn't find the work very strenuous. It was not so intellectually uh, demanding. And it would give him ample time to contemplate the universe. He never would have been very good at a university kissing up to a senior professor. He was much better at a stool in the patent office, trying to daydream about what is it like to ride alongside a light beam. From that job, he would launch a revolution which would change world history. Einstein's idle daydreams will profoundly change the way the universe is understood. In 1905, in what's been called his miracle year, he publishes in his spare time four visionary papers, the first of which answers the age-old question, what is light? The photoelectric effect. This paper, written by this total unknown, showed that light comes as a particle called the photon. We use that in television. We use that in lasers. In another paper, the 26-year-old Einstein posits something we now take for granted, the existence of atoms. 
People didn't believe in atoms in those days, but he proved that atoms can actually make small little dust particles move in a liquid. And he calculated the size of atoms. These papers would have been a remarkable career for any physicist, but Einstein is far from finished. He writes yet another paper with the famous equation E equals mc squared. At the simplest level, this means energy can become matter, and matter can become energy. The tiniest speck of matter holds potentially huge amounts of energy. Unleashing it requires a nuclear reaction, the sort going on constantly in the night sky. Ever since people began to look up in the heavens, they would say, what makes the stars shine? But it took Albert Einstein to answer the question. Mass, M, turns into E, energy. That is the engine that lights up the stars. Today, E equals mc squared is Einstein's most famous equation. But another theory he publishes this same year is more important and more controversial, the special theory of relativity. When Einstein was a teenager, he enjoyed imagining what it would be like to ride a beam of light. Now, he returns to this daydream, and it changes his life. In the spring of 1905, Einstein was riding on a bus, and he looked back at the famous clock tower that dominates Bern, Switzerland. And then he imagined, what happens if that bus were racing near the speed of light? In his imagination, Einstein looks back at the clock tower, and what he sees is astonishing. As he reaches the speed of light, the hands of the clock appear frozen in time. Einstein would later write, a storm broke in my mind. All of a sudden, everything, everything kept gushing forward. Einstein knows that back at the clock tower, time is passing normally. But on Einstein's light speed bus, as he reaches the speed of light, the light from the clock can no longer catch up to him. The faster he races through space, the slower he moves through time. This insight sparks the birth of Einstein's special theory of relativity, which says that space and time are deeply connected. In fact, they are one and the same, a flexible fabric called space-time. Sitting alone on a city bus, Einstein believes he has glimpsed a secret of the universe. For Einstein, space was this place where stuff was, and it didn't do anything. It had stuff in it. And so space combined with time to become space-time is a more dynamic understanding of this arena that everything takes place in. It's becoming more alive in a way. He's saying very, very outlandish and very, very strange things. Rarely had anything so radical been submitted to Europe's most prestigious scientific journals. He was a complete outsider to the physics of his day, as he was being in Switzerland, being a patent clerk. And yet he was ambitious enough to think that he could challenge the whole of the established physics at the time. You always hope that there will be total euphoria, that everybody will say this is a, you know, a huge step forward in the subject. But that rarely happens. Whatever one's concept of time, it passes slowly for Einstein at the patent office. He submits papers to important scientific journals, the best scientific journals, and hopes for the best. And the best doesn't come for a while. He was anxious. What was the reaction of the physics community to his great paper? Silence. Einstein got very depressed. Three, four, five months must have felt like an eternity to him. And then Einstein's papers fall into the hands of perhaps the one man who can fully understand him, Max Planck. Max Planck is the greatest theoretical physicist in Europe. Planck who was the editor of the Annalen der Physik in Berlin. The most important physics journal of the time. Here was Max Planck reading this paper from this unknown physicist. And Max Planck says, ah, there is something here. Planck recognized immediately that this was an important paper from an important young scholar. The relativity paper was published in June 1905. 
That volume, number 17, is now one of the most famous publications in the history of science. At the time, Einstein wasn't even a scientist. He's still applying for jobs at colleges, high schools, always getting rejected. We call it Einstein's miracle year. It is certainly not uh, a time that he would describe himself as a miracle year. Miracles convey a sense of something happening easily. I don't think that Planck knew that Einstein was a patent clerk of the third class. So he must have then become curious about who this unknown Albert Einstein in Bern was. This unknown Einstein is in fact the father of a one-year-old son and husband to a quiet and serious fellow student from the Swiss Polytechnic, Maleva Maric. When he was at the Polytechnic in Zurich, he was quite a ladies' man. He would play his violin at ladies' luncheons and cocktail parties, so he knew quite a few young women in his day. But Maleva caught his eye. Maleva is the only woman in the class. Here was a physicist. He was smitten. In a temporary detour from their shared scientific passions, Albert and Maleva are married in 1903. A year later, their first son, Hans Albert, is born. The Einstein family lives in this small two-room apartment in the Swiss capital. The rather limited circumstances in which they lived were not what he would have hoped for at this stage in his life. Maleva had always wanted to be a great physicist, but she flunks her exams at the end of her terms at the Zurich Polytech. She becomes a sounding board on all the great miracle year papers of 1905, especially the special relativity paper. She helps type it up. She helps check the math. But she ends up being a housewife. Einstein is trying to do his scientific work at the same time that he's working six days a week. In 1907, Einstein agrees to write a new article explaining special relativity. But when he re-examines his theory, he finds it seriously limited. It was called special relativity for a reason, and that was because it really only dealt with moving at constant speeds. In other words, Einstein's special theory of relativity only applies to a special case, an object moving in one direction at a constant speed. But Einstein wants to understand the real world, and the real world doesn't work that way. But Einstein realized that his theory failed for accelerations. But in our universe, everything accelerates. On a bumpy road, jet airplanes, on a subway car, everything's accelerating. So there was a defect in special relativity. On Einstein's imaginary journey, if his speed varies at all, his theory, his notion of how objects behave in time and space, falls apart. His scientific mind wants it to apply to all cases. Einstein knows that for his theory to work, it has to account for everything in the universe. And that includes the pervasive and invisible force that holds everything together. Gravity. Gravity is everywhere. Gravity holds us to the floor. Gravity holds the sun together, the solar system together. Where was gravity in special relativity? Einstein wants to expand his special theory of relativity into a general theory of relativity. A theory that will explain not just time, but also gravity. He realizes he will be fighting more than two centuries of scientific thought and his hero, Sir Isaac Newton. It's 1907, and the 28-year-old Albert Einstein is still a patent office bureaucrat. It has been two years since he published his special theory of relativity and the ambitious Einstein decides to advance an even more radical interpretation of the universe, a general theory of relativity. Doing this will require him to take on his scientific hero, Sir Isaac Newton. In Einstein's time, Isaac Newton was God. Newton was the founder of modern science. This is the actual first edition of Newton's Principia Mathematica of 1687. This 
priceless artifact is the very, very famous book which became the foundation of universal physics for centuries until Einstein upset the apple cart. It has been almost 250 years since the apple fell from the legendary tree on Isaac Newton's estate, giving Newton the inspiration to formulate his law of gravity. Newton said that if an object falls, it's because there's a mysterious force called gravity pulling it down. But you know, Isaac Newton himself was not satisfied by that. Objects move because they're pushed. Not pulled, objects move because they're pushed. So what is pushing this? Newton didn't know. So Newton simply threw his hands up and said, I don't know. So I'm going to invent something called gravitational pull. And Einstein said, no, this theory can't be right. He was prepared to simply go, I really want to solve this problem. I want to really understand the whole universe. Max Planck said to him, you can work on gravity if you want to, but there are two problems. You're not going to be successful. The problem is too hard. And if you do, no one will believe you. It's an extremely difficult task. It's not clear where to begin or how to go about doing it at all. Ultimately, the thing that gives him that clue turns out to be his old faithful way of reasoning, the thought experiment. So it's what you and I would call daydreaming, but he gets to call them thought experiments because he's Einstein. He's in his office at the patent office, looking out at the window, and he imagined a man working on a roof and he begins to wonder what would happen if one of those men were to fall off the roof. And then he had the happiest thought of his life, the inspiration of the ages. He had a vision. The man will not actually be feeling his own weight. He would be weightless. And then he imagined, if you're in an elevator and somebody cuts the cord, what happens to you? You fall. But the elevator falls at the same rate you do, so you are weightless inside the elevator. So then Einstein got it. It's as though gravity's been switched off. What's really going on? There is no such thing as gravitational pull. The Earth has curved the space around me, and space is pushing me into this chair. Space itself can be curved. Crazy sound. <laughs> Space is adjustable. It's actually malleable. Space and time are malleable. It's this flexible thing that can be twisted. You bring an object into space and it distorts the space around it. Why does the Earth go around the sun? Most people would say, well, the sun's gravity is yanking the Earth toward the sun in a circle. Wrong. The Earth is going around the sun because the sun has warped the space around the Earth, and space is pushing, pushing the Earth toward the sun. He had a new theory of gravity, a new theory of the universe. Einstein publishes his ideas about gravity. At the same time, his work on the atom brings him increased attention. As a result, in 1911, he's offered a position as a full-time scientist at the University of Zurich. The 32-year-old patent clerk finally leaves Bern to become, for the first time, Professor Albert Einstein. People start realizing that those miracle year papers of 1905 are probably right. And he starts getting invited to the Solvay conferences, which are the gatherings of the greatest physicists in Europe. Convened by the Belgian philanthropist Ernest Solvay, these conferences bring together the greatest scientific minds in Europe, and Albert Einstein is among them. In fact, he's the youngest professor there. He made an impression. He was friendly, he was funny, and he was smart, really smart, and people saw that. That was also a moment when Mileva must have perceived that she was part, still part, of this small burn world, whereas Einstein had become part of a bigger world. 
she writes these plaintive letters saying, tell me about it. I wish I were there. I would love to meet these great scientists. It was always my dream to meet these great scientists. She became jealous of not only the other physicists, but of physics itself. Einstein's lectures become the talk of scientific Europe, and he's invited to speak in Berlin, capital of the country in which he was born. Berlin at the time was the most vibrant city in Central Europe. Einstein hadn't been in Germany since he left at age 15 to avoid the draft. He renounced his German citizenship the next year. While Einstein was in Berlin, mainly to visit colleagues, he was also invited by a cousin, a first cousin named Elsa Einstein. They had known each other as kids, but Einstein had uh, lost track of her. Living on her own, had divorced, she had two daughters. She's just the opposite of Maleva. She's not a scientist, she's not an intellectual, but she loves making big old dinners and taking care of Einstein. They liked each other's company, taking long walks, looking at the boats, and he must have been fascinated by her. Einstein returns to Zurich. They exchange fiery love letters. And at one point, it becomes so strong that Einstein says, please don't write me anymore. This isn't going to work. He must have felt that this was an overcomplex situation, even for an Albert Einstein. <laughs> if the mysteries of the heart elude Einstein, the mysteries of the universe trouble him even more. The curvature of space and the warping of space-time, and you just, you scratch your head. He has now been struggling for four years to more fully develop his general theory of relativity. His theory of relativity is so complicated that very few people can understand it. Somebody's got to test it. It's not a testable hypothesis. It's not science. It's science fiction. Einstein knows he's on the right track towards solving his theory. Now he must find a way to prove it. It's 1911. For four frustrating years, Einstein has struggled to perfect his general theory of relativity. His theory won't be accepted until he can demonstrate this radical concept. Suddenly, he is struck by an idea. If he can shine a beam of light through an area where space is curved, then according to his theory, the beam of light will actually appear to bend. Light only knows straight lines. What's bent is space. What could have enough gravity to bend light so much? Well, what about the sun? 300,000 times more massive than the Earth, the sun is the perfect object for Einstein's experiment. But how can anyone shine a beam of light around the sun? He says light from a distant star as it passes right next to the sun in the sun's gravitational field will be bent because space is bent uh, around the sun but even if einstein is right he'll never be able to see it happen because the sun is just too bright except when is the sun covered so that we can see what's around it without being blinded by the light that only occurs during a total solar eclipse Here's the sun, and it's blocked by the moon, and suddenly all the stars come out. He figured if you have the sun here, and there's stars way back here, and the light's coming in toward you, it will bend slightly. So to your eye, you think that the stars had gone out like that. Light going around the sun. That's something that even his mother could understand. Nobody actually was willing to say, without doubt, this is the truth, until somebody can prove it by taking a picture. So who do you turn to? You turn to the astronomers, the astrophysicists. Our laboratory is the entire universe. By 1912, Einstein believes he is finally on the verge of proving his long percolating and provocative theory. He publishes this revolutionary prediction and puts the call out to the astronomy world, go out and measure, he said, go to an eclipse and do this observation. Nothing happened. 
He actually wrote to well-known astronomers trying to interest them in doing a test and was a little discouraged, I think, because he discovered, as people often do, that astronomers are busy people with many things to do and don't necessarily drop everything at the drop of a hat, even for Einstein. It's a frustrating and bitter setback for Einstein. But then, at the Berlin Observatory, a young assistant answers the call. He's an impassioned and brazen young man who's willing to go, quite literally, to the ends of the earth for Einstein. His name is Erwin Finley Freundlich. Freundlich was in his early 20s. He wanted to make a name for himself. He got a sense that here is my chance. This is new stuff. It's important stuff, and I could be part of it. I've seen the letter that goes the, in the other direction from Einstein to Freundlich, and it's all filled with this excitement. You astronomers can do great help to me by finding proof of the relativity theory. And that's Einstein, the human being, who is trying to get somebody to do things for him because he needs him. He finds out from Freundlich that he's getting married to his girlfriend, Katja and they're going to honeymoon in the Alps. So Einstein says, come to Zurich and let's meet. Freundlich is on his honeymoon with his bride and he goes to meet Einstein. He's looking for, for him out the window and there he is, there's Einstein. He can recognize him because he's wearing this straw hat and he's standing out like a sore thumb. And this is the famous Einstein that he's corresponding with, with this prediction and this great opportunity and he's going to get to meet him. So he gets off the train and he shakes his hand and they're all animated. And before they can talk, they whisk the couple off the train and they go to Frauenfeld nearby. It's a suburb. To their surprise, the newlyweds are spending their honeymoon in an auditorium listening to Einstein speak. And in the middle of the lecture, Einstein says, we need this eclipse test, and the man who's going to decide is sitting in the audience. His name's Erwin Freundlich, and there he is, and everyone looks, and Freundlich has to stand up and be recognized. And so Freundlich was thrilled, you know, this recognition at this great meeting. On the way back to Zurich, Einstein engages Freundlich in an intense discussion about gravitation while the new fiance, Katya, just looks at the scenery. They start hatching up that plan of going to a total solar eclipse. The problem with the total solar eclipse, of course, is that it's only visible over a small area of the Earth because the shadow of the moon is actually only a few miles wide. They get these tables and they realize that the next total solar eclipse will occur in the Crimea, which is in Russian territory, on the 21st of August, 1914. Freundlich goes to his boss, says, look, let's go to Russia. I'm collaborating with Einstein. Will you put the money up? And he says, no way. He just refuses. Einstein is absolutely furious. Reaching beyond the European scientific establishment, Freundlich writes to the director of the Lick Observatory, near San Jose, California, a rugged outpost of American astronomy. It was a community living on the mountain. They all had their families, their wives were there, their kids were there. They were depending on each other for survival. For many years, it had the largest refracting telescope in the world. But most importantly, it has William Wallace Campbell, a pioneer of eclipse photography. In the 19th century, eclipses used to be attended by astronomers who just did visual observations. I saw this, I saw that, they would draw diagrams, and if people disagreed, it was one guy's word over another. Photography meant you can actually capture what was happening and do precise measurements. Campbell pioneered that technique in the early 20th century. Freundlich writes a personal letter to Campbell he says, there's going to be an eclipse in 1914. Why don't you come to Russia and let's do this? So there's this wonderful correspondence between Campbell and Freundlich, the senior doyen of California astronomy and this little pipsqueak of an assistant in Berlin who's doing this against the will of his boss. They will be the first to either confirm or to discredit Einstein's new theory of gravity. 
this was an important observation. Campbell had a fever in him. He saw fantastic opportunities for Lick Observatory and for America. And he says, I'm going to get this sucker. This is a tough problem, and I'm going to be the one to crack it. Meanwhile, opportunity is knocking on Einstein's door. His original mentor, Max Planck, is asked by the King of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II, to recruit the best scientists for a new institution in Berlin. Planck recommends the young man he considers his own discovery, Albert Einstein. And they said, if we bring Einstein here, people will look at this and say, Berlin is where the action is. It's worth whatever it takes to get him here. On July 11th, 1913, two men arrive at the Zurich train station, Max Planck and Walter Nernst, a renowned German chemist. They are hoping that a personal appeal will persuade the rebellious young scientist to return to his German homeland. Two men, middle-aged guys in dark clothes, get off the train, and they go find Einstein. They're so different. Max Planck is very proper Prussian, always very well-dressed and well-groomed, wearing the monocle, talking in very formal tones. And there's Einstein, who's refusing even back then to comb his hair and uh, dressed in, you know, sort of old coats and however he feels like it, already starting not to wear socks. They make a great offer to him. He'll be a professor at the University of Berlin. He'll be a member of the Prussian Academy. He won't really have to teach classes. He'll have all of the research help he needs. It was Max Planck. It was Nernst. It was the Prussian Academy of Sciences. It was the entire world of physics that had said no, bearing down and saying, we want you. Einstein did not answer the offer. Einstein says, why don't you just go take a trip for the rest of the afternoon up the mountain? I said, I'll meet you at the train station when you come back. I'll be carrying a bunch of flowers. And if the flowers are red, I'm coming to Germany. And if flowers are white, sorry, no go. Thanks for coming. I've made the argument that Einstein delayed his answer to this question, in part because he sort of wanted to live with the pleasure of being so deeply sought after. But it's certainly true that this was not simply a snap decision. As he often does when he has a difficult problem to solve, Einstein takes a long walk. Zurich was comfortable. There was lots still up there. You, you know, you, you don't just sort of walk away from that. His wife really wants to stay in Zurich. On the other hand, they have offered him the greatest job imaginable. There was one other thing enticing Einstein to Berlin. At some point, he received a birthday card. It was Elsa writing him a postcard. This must have exploded on him as, you know, reawakening all these emotions. Planck and Nernst come back there at the train station. Einstein is there. It was a dramatic moment. It was a self-consciously dramatic moment. There would have been a little dramatic flair there. He's holding his flowers. And they look, and the flower is red. Einstein says, gentlemen, I'll go to Germany. I'm going to become one of you. By April 1914, Einstein's world is looking brighter. The solar eclipse needed to help prove Einstein's long gestating general theory of relativity is only four months away. And Einstein is on his way to Berlin to join the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, an elite group of scientists working under Fritz Haber, the Institute's director. Fritz Haber was one of the greatest chemists of the 20th century. He developed a, a process that could be used in producing uh, an artificial fertilizer with the help of which millions could be fed. And he was a hero. Haber and his family host Einstein's wife, Maleva Maric, while she looks for an apartment for herself, Albert, and their two children. Haber observes that resettling in Berlin seems to be unsettling relations between Einstein and his wife. 
Maleva always was a brooding and somewhat despondent woman. And in Berlin, it gets much worse. He's dallying with his cousin, Elsa. Einstein is a very brutally honest guy, so every now and then, he apparently would tell Maleva about Elsa. Then they start fighting with each other. Not surprisingly, the man who approaches the universe in a unique way has a rather unconventional approach to married life. Einstein gives Maleva an ultimatum. If you want to stay married to me, you have to do the following things. It's a contract. It says you have to bring me my meals in my room. You have to speak to me only when I want to have conversation. You're not to expect intimacies from me. More power to her. She doesn't sign this contract. She decides, no, I'm not going to go for that. She goes and stays again with Haber and his wife, Clara. In that time, Haber is sort of a go-between and is negotiating. He's trying to hold them together. He's the one who keeps seeing if maybe they can come to an accommodation. They both respect him. But Haber's best efforts to save the Einstein's marriage are a failure. The decision to split is finally irrevocable, and Einstein says, it's not going to happen. Lacking enough money to support two households, Einstein makes Maleva a brazenly self-confident proposition. He offers her a deal. He says to her, one of these days, one of my papers will win the Nobel Prize. If you give me a divorce, I'll give you the money. Now, this is an amazing sum of money. She could end up very wealthy, and she could move back to Zurich with the kids. He is sure he's going to get a Nobel Prize. Maleva's not quite sure. She's a scientist. She calculates the odds. She consults with Fritz Haber. She decides to take the bet. Maleva takes the two young boys, and Einstein accompanies her, along with Fritz Haber. Einstein has to go to the train station, say goodbye to his boys. And he starts crying. Haber's never seen him cry before. And this was a, a really quite devastating moment for him. And Haber was the man he was with, sort of holding him up through this moment. Einstein has staked his children's future on winning the Nobel Prize, by no means a sure bet. He is dependent on Erwin Freundlich and William Campbell to bring him photos of the total solar eclipse so he can see how the stars seem to move. Shortly before saying goodbye to Maleva and the boys, Einstein has another farewell at the Berlin train station. There is Freundlich with his two buddies about to leave Berlin. Einstein is there. He's very, very anxious. Freundlich and two of his colleagues are lugging four astronomical cameras and cumbersome equipment on a long and treacherous journey. They're going to take a train and go all the way to the Crimea in Russian territory. Freundlich and Campbell hope to maximize their chances of good weather and good eclipse photographs by camping in different sites. Freundlich's party sets up in southeastern Crimea. Campbell locates near Kiev. They are both determined, despite the frightening and spreading rumors of a world war. Then the worst happens. On June 28, 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria is assassinated. The German Kaiser declares war on Russia, and Einstein's eclipse expeditions are suddenly in jeopardy. Einstein is really worried. Einstein has no way to warn them. Didn't know what was going to happen. And then, deep in the Crimean forest, the war comes to Freundlich's camp. Freundlich suddenly sees some uniformed Russian officers coming to his camp and asking him for his papers heart starts going beep 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 russians come over to see what they're doing and realize these are germans with a telescope and they start tearing down his equipment get off my equipment i have to observe an eclipse these are our possessions now your country declared war on us you have nothing to say they arrest them immediately there's no questions asked and they are considered spies herr freundlich you are now a prisoner of war what Campbell, an American, is neutral. And the Russians allowed them to continue to observe the eclipse. 
they had come all this way, spent all this money, survived the fact that war broke out, and clouds ruined their plans. Total failure. Not only does Campbell fail to get his photograph, but he is forced to abandon his state-of-the-art equipment. Because he is an American, Campbell is not arrested, but he leaves for home a defeated man. Campbell says one wants to come home by the back door and see nobody. Einstein in Berlin is shattered. The expeditions are failures. Freundlich and his team spend several months as prisoners of war in Russia. For Einstein, it is a disaster. Proof of his most revolutionary theory, general relativity, is slipping between his fingers. The outbreak of World War I leaves Einstein's Russian eclipse expedition in shambles and threatens to further obscure the long-sought proof of the relativity theory on which Einstein has labored for years. The war killed communication between scientists. The open exchange of ideas was gone overnight. Ties were cut. Once the United States joins the war, astronomer William Campbell sees things differently. Campbell dedicated himself to the eclipse problem, independently of his former colleague from Germany, who he now viewed as the enemy. In Berlin, the whole atmosphere changed. When Einstein looked out of his window, he would see a lot of patriotism. In his eyes, a whole nation went crazy. All of Einstein's expectations of the kind of city he was going to live in disappear. They're gone. Hundreds of thousands of German young men marched enthusiastically. His best colleagues, Planck and Haber, were enthusiastic about the war. His close friend Fritz Haber, like Einstein, was born German and Jewish. Fritz Haber converted to Christianity, and he tried to assimilate as much as possible. One of his great moments of pride when he actually received a commission in the German army really almost unheard of award for a converted Jew. Einstein saw this as ridiculous. Haber said, I'm a chemist. I understand the chemistry of the chlorine atom very well. I know that chlorine gas is poisonous. Can I turn this into a useful weapon? Haber felt he could construct a devastating enough weapon that it would end the war quickly, thus a humane outcome. The Institute Haber directs is turned into testing gas to be deployed on the Western Front. Einstein has an office in Haber's Institute. Einstein was disgusted by the eagerness with which Haber, first amongst his colleagues, but many of his colleagues, went looking for ways to kill people and kill them more effectively. Haber was one of the first to develop terrible weapons out of the potential of science. Early in the war, Haber's new mystery weapon, poison gas, is tested on a Belgian battlefield. Haber was there and said, release the weapon. This low cloud drifted over the battlefield, and the cloud just sort of forms this was the first time this ever happened. Troops had seen things that looked much worse than this cloud. And the effect was devastating. I mean, the troops were just blown out of their trenches. Haber saw thousands of people die. Thousands of soldiers, about 5,000 soldiers. Your lungs begin to fill with fluid, and as the deterioration of your body continues, you can lie there on dry ground, in effect, drowning. Albert Einstein takes a look at his close friend and his, you know, intimate professional colleague and says, in effect, you're pathological. This is grotesque. He writes a letter to a friend in Switzerland that says, all our supposed technological progress is like an axe in the hands of a madman. 
Haber never resented it. And it's so strange that he befriended Einstein so closely. They were living on different planets. The war posed a big dilemma for Einstein because in his personal relationships he respected and was even fond of his colleagues, but um, rejected their wholehearted support of the war. He comes across this very publicly hyped and published document called the Manifesto of 93 signed by 93 leading German academics, including the people who brought him to Berlin and the people he most values, Haber, and above all, Max Planck. The manifesto says Germany had to fight. It was justified and morally acceptable to fight in this war. And this shocked Einstein. In effect, a betrayal. This was the moment when Einstein realized that there were some things about life outside physics that were important enough that he had to actually go out on a limb and take some personal risk to defend. He actually tries to present a counter manifesto of other German academics who say, no, there's something else out there besides national pride, national um, competitiveness, national fury. And four people sign the manifesto goes nowhere, never published, it fails. He becomes a pacifist, he becomes a war resistor. And Einstein was nearly alone. He's isolated, he's being rejected by his colleagues. His marriage is breaking up, he's having a custody battle for his kids. He immerses himself in his science. The isolation has a positive outcome as Einstein looks again at his general relativity theory he refocuses on the mathematical equations. One day, he looked back at the calculation for the bending of light as it goes around the sun, and he suddenly realized his earlier calculation was wrong. What would have been found had Freundlich done the observation was only half the deflection that's there, half the bending of the sunlight. It would have discredited Einstein's theory. It is an embarrassing but serendipitous discovery. For three years, Einstein has been urging astronomers to photograph an eclipse, which would prove an equation that he now believes to be wrong. Einstein has always considered the failed eclipse expeditions to be setbacks. In fact, they may have saved his career. The war raging all around him, the physicist retreats to his study. He had a little apartment, and most of his thinking was done in his study. Sometimes he can't quite visualize the curving of space. And what he does is he takes out his violin. He said that Mozart's music captured the harmonies of the universe. Playing the violin would help him think. Einstein had this prodigious ability to sit and think. It was called Sitzfleisch. People who knew him said he had this remarkable Sitzfleisch where he can concentrate on a problem for hours, for days, even years. In his office are lots of mathematical manuscripts with equations all over. And he's sitting there thinking, walking around, standing deep in thought. He's doing pure mathematics in his mind. Science is done by the seat of your pants. We have leaps of logic. We have years of wandering in the wilderness. We have frustration. We have pulling our hairs out. That is really the power of genius, the force of will to make all the mistakes necessary to get the right answer. There was never a moment of, oh no, I'm not going to have a theory. That, uh, because of his ego, I don't think it ever occurred to him that he's not going to have a theory. What matters is you keep your eye on the prize. For Einstein, that prize is the Nobel, proceeds of which he has promised to Maleva and his two sons. In 1915, he's asked to present his general theory of relativity at a prestigious forum to the most important German scientists. Einstein accepts. But after eight years of work, his theory still has two major problems. It's completely unproven, and the math appears to be flawed. 
After nearly a decade of work, Einstein's general theory of relativity is still far from finished. His math is wrong, and without the correct calculation, his theory can't be proven. And now, he's scheduled to deliver a paper to the most prestigious scientific gathering in Germany. Prussian Academy, it's a very formal place. It's a place that knows how distinguished it is and how historically significant it is. These weekly meetings you can sort of see as, as an attempt by, by, you know, at least some of Germany's leading thinkers to act as if the war were not all there was. Einstein is to present his theory of general relativity. The problem for Einstein is he hadn't finished it yet. In the fall of 1915, Einstein was hardly thinking about uh, anything else. He was completely focused on finding the solution to a puzzle that had occupied him for more than eight years. Einstein is trying to come up with these equations that describe how space is curved. And he's working deep into the night if you look closely, it's really trial and error. You're not seeing a mathematician who just, you know, throws the ideas, you know, perfect formulas onto, onto the paper of the notebook. He cancels everything and says nonsense. These terms disturb, so he's sort of talking to the math. Sometimes he turns the notebook around and then he you know, throws it away with disgust. It can be a real blow when an idea you've been working on doesn't work out this gut-wrenching feeling. Since discovering his math error, Einstein believes he is making real progress. His equations are nearly complete. He accepts an invitation to speak at Göttingen University, essentially a dress rehearsal for the Prussian Academy. Einstein is up at the board writing his equations and trying to describe his problem. In the audience is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, David Hilbert. Hilbert sits there and listens very carefully to Einstein. He thinks, I can solve the problem. I can do it better than Einstein. There's always this worry that you might get scooped. You become a little bit paranoid, or sometimes a lot paranoid. There's always this feeling I have when I, when I have a good idea, which is that, well, if I've had this good idea, that probably means that someone else is going to have or has had this good idea too. Einstein goes back to Berlin and Hilbert goes into his own office. And Hilbert sits there and thinks and tries to race Einstein to the big prize of general relativity. He was one of the greatest mathematicians of his time. A controversy between the two giants, a giant of physics and a giant of mathematics. Hilbert, the nasty guy here who thinks he can beat Einstein, starts working. Hilbert thought that physics was much too important to be left to the physicists, so the mathematicians should take care of it. The stakes are very high here, all or nothing, to unlock the secret of light, to unlock the secret of gravity. Nobody can ever say that Einstein is not a fantastic mathematician, because at that moment, the problem is distilled into pure mathematics. Several times, Einstein thought he had it. When he submitted one of the versions to the Prussian Academy, he wrote his son in Switzerland, you know, you will later understand that this was a great day that changed history, uh, and your father was, you know, producing it. But it turned out, again, to be a, an erroneous version. He had to change it a week later once more. He had tried many alleys before, and they turned out to be dead ends. How long do you wait developing this idea writing the paper, working out all the consequences before publishing it. Einstein had to be really afraid that Hilbert would uh, actually take over the whole game and publish the final equations of general relativity before him. All of a sudden, he discovered that several pointers all seemed to point in the same direction. Einstein remembered that he had given up a very radical solution that he had uh, stumbled upon already in 1912 and that he had then discarded because it looked just physically too unfamiliar, too unacceptable. But now, after he had tried out all these other alternatives, he was ready to return exactly to that equation, back to an equation that he had earlier considered and then discarded three years before. 
you realize that you've been wrong in a real flash of inspiration because you realized what you should be doing. You know, he had it all in his drawer. And that's, of course, then a glorious moment. There it was, the equation that he had discarded, and uh, now it, was, it looked much more promising, much more useful than it had in the winter of 1912. It isn't always a dark time when you realize that you're wrong. Sometimes it's a wonderful time. The excitement for Einstein comes with the realization that the answer for his new theory can be found in an old astronomical riddle. Einstein began to look at a mystery that had puzzled astronomers for generations. According to Isaac Newton, the planet Mercury should be going around the sun like this. But it was known for quite a while that the orbit of Mercury deviates from Newton's laws of motion. It tilts a little bit. So the orbit, instead of going like this, begins to tilt. And it begins to make a pattern like the petals of a flower. Einstein realizes his thoughts on gravity might explain Mercury's orbit in ways the Newton's law could not. Was Newton wrong? Einstein says, maybe it's my theory of gravity. Is this simple enough to explain all the experimental data? He calculated painfully the orbit of Mercury, and there was a near-perfect match. His equations on a notepad matched the motion of heavenly bodies in outer space. He has heart palpitations, and he suddenly realized, oh my god, the theory is correct. He was, he was so filled with joy that he couldn't make his brain focus. And for Einstein, that's a big deal. He finally gets the equations right, just as David Hilbert does. There's a little bit of a dispute. Who got the equations first? There's a lot of rancor at that moment. Einstein gets so hurt. Hilbert was very gracious. He says, it's Einstein's theory. Einstein deserves the credit. He's victorious. The theory is Einstein's. On November 25th, 1915, a momentarily triumphant Albert Einstein holds in his hands what he believes is the final equation for the general theory of relativity, his theory of gravity, just in time for his presentation at the Prussian Academy. He goes to the Academy and he speaks. Not for very long, it's a short paper. And with that, you have the general theory of relativity, which describes how space and time tell matter and energy where to go, Matter and energy tell space and time how to look. Utterly different view of what our universe is like. Who knows how much applause he got? Nobody does. Everyone suddenly found themselves confronted with the idea that this strange German Jew had overthrown Newton's ideas of gravity. What exactly this meant now, no one was quite sure. There's still no physical proof of it. No one understood Einstein. Einstein believes he has finally got his theory right, but he knows that it won't be accepted until he can prove it. And he can't prove it without photographs of a total solar eclipse. For that, Einstein will have to wait again. Einstein publishes his completed general theory of relativity in 1916 with the corrected mathematical equation. But there is still much work to be done. He needs photographs of a rare solar eclipse to prove the theory's accuracy. But in war-ravaged Berlin, now under blockade by the British, even the basic necessities of life are hard to come by. Surrounding him, Berlin was an impoverished city, and the hunger grew so bad that there were hunger riots. In the middle of a harsh winter, Einstein's intense productivity comes to a sudden halt. The reason he stops is he's exhausted and he's sick. Bad stomach problems. He's really, really, really sick. He writes, I don't eat. I haven't been able to sleep. And he succumbs to a physical and a mental breakdown. Einstein retreats to a small apartment in Berlin. His cousin Elsa becomes his nurse and savior. Elsa keeps cooking for him, bringing him food, eventually having Einstein move in with her. While Einstein's health is in Elsa's hands, 
the fate of his theory lies with astronomers. One of them who will play an important role is at Cambridge University in England. Arthur Eddington is a scientist, but also a religious man, who attends this small Quaker meeting house just across the street from the university. Sitting in the back row at this Quaker meeting, full of people sitting quietly, is Arthur Stanley Eddington, head of the Cambridge Observatory, known all around the world as one of the most brilliant minds in astronomy. The war has taken a heavy toll on Eddington and his fellow Quakers, nearly all of whom morally opposed the war and refused to fight the Germans. He's one of the few men left. It's just him and the women. Day by day, men were disappearing from these benches. Not because they were going off to fight in the war, but because they were being arrested for being conscientious objectors. Anti-German feeling cripples scientific communication. Eddington knows nothing of Einstein's new theory until February 1916, when he receives a package from a colleague in the neutral Netherlands, astronomer Willem de Sitter. Inside is a copy of Einstein's paper that de Sitter has translated into English. Eddington opens it up and realizes immediately that he's seeing something of tremendous scientific significance. And he writes back to de Sitter, no one in England knows about this, no one. So he asks de Sitter, tell me about this Einstein. De Sitter says, well, Einstein didn't like the war, and in fact had written a manifesto against the war. And when Eddington hears this, he says, this is perfect. This is so important, we have to do something with it. The mission becomes more than a scientific quest. Like Einstein, Eddington is isolated because of his political convictions. Eddington sees this exciting scientific challenge as a way to show that scientists across enemy lines can support each other for a higher purpose. Eddington says, relativity is the most important scientific theory since Newton, and it's done by a German, and even better, Einstein, a brilliant, peaceful scientist. He wanted to stand up there and show the world and show his scientific colleagues that an Englishman will stand up for a German. And the Eclipse Expedition was the perfect opportunity. But the forces of interplanetary alignment may not wait for the war to be over. The next full eclipse will occur in June 1918, and it won't be visible in England, where Eddington is trapped by war. However, it will be seen in the state of Washington, practically in the backyard of a man who has been down this road before, William Wallace Campbell of California's Lick Observatory. There was going to be another eclipse in 1918, not very far from Lick Observatory in Goldendale, Washington in the west. If Campbell succeeds in photographing this eclipse, he can be the first person to determine if Einstein's theory is right or wrong. Because there was a war going on, no one else could go. The Europeans couldn't send an expedition, and so he had the field to himself. But Campbell also has a problem. They didn't have their equipment because it was still trapped in Russia. Campbell had been forced to abandon his state-of-the-art camera gear in the Crimea back in 1914 when World War I first broke out. So he improvises. Campbell went scrabbling around for equipment in Lick Observatory. They got a lens here, a tube here, and they cobbled together a couple of cameras for Goldendale. The Lick party was forced to use substandard equipment. Campbell has no choice but to take the risk. He has a total solar eclipse all to himself and may never have another opportunity like this again. Campbell's party travels to Goldendale, Washington and gets ready for the coming eclipse. It was close to home, so the whole family went. Campbell's goal is to photograph the stars that emerge in the brief period when the sun is hidden by the moon. But on Saturday, June 8th, 1918, it seems that the universe is once again not ready to yield its secrets. Clouds moved in, and it looked like he wouldn't even get observations, and Russia would be repeated, which he hated. And suddenly, just at the crucial time, when they needed a clear sky, the clouds parted. 
Campbell begins taking photographs of the spectacle. It starts when the moon first comes in contact with the sun and then starts to move over the face of the sun. The sun becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until the last moment when the sunlight actually passes through the valleys between the mountains of the moon. And then this bright, brilliant beam of sunlight, and then the sun is entirely eclipsed. It's the blackest black you will ever see. My first eclipse, I, I literally lost my breath. It was like jumping in cold water where you go, <gasps> you know, you, you can't believe it. It is, it is, breathtaking, <laughs> literally breathtaking. It's a, it's a gorgeous sight. It's just, wow. Most powerful experience that I've ever had in my life. The New York Times had a reporter and they wrote an article, clouds fall away for eclipse. There's a little subtitle, test of Einstein theory. This is the first time that an American newspaper mentioned Albert Einstein. Campbell assigns his most trusted astronomer, Heber D. Curtis, to analyze the photographs to prove or disprove Einstein's theory. Looking in, a star would have been visible, one of the stars that was to be measured. Uh, that star would have been very carefully centered on crosshairs in the eyepiece. Once that was done, the scales could be read in the X and Y directions, and a very precise position could be assigned to the star. From those numbers, it could be determined whether the star had appeared to change position. Einstein has predicted that the warped space around the sun will create an optical illusion, making the stars appear to move outward ever so slightly. Einstein predicted much less than a millimeter. Well, this is not an easy measurement to make. Unlike most theories that people put forth, Einstein's general relativity makes very specific predictions. Very tight, very, it's got to be this. And if it's not that, then the entire foundation of the idea has got to be discarded. Extremely precise, painstaking measurements. There was no wiggle room in Einstein's relativity because the idea, the idea that gravity is the manifestation of the curvature of space and time. You're going to say how much it curves and what happens to matter or light in the presence of that curvature? Calculate it, make the prediction. If the prediction doesn't come true, you don't go say, OK, let me see if I can tweak the theory. Not in this case. You can see on these pages the kind of labor that Curtis had to endure in order to make these measurements. There's page after page after page of this. Some pages crossed out. All you needed was one experiment to show that any aspect of relativity would fail. And he'd have to go back to the drawing board completely. Curtis looks at the stars and sees nothing unusual. They all appear in their normal places, which can only mean one thing. Einstein is wrong. But Campbell is unwilling to risk his reputation on improvised equipment. Nobody wants to reveal an answer until everything has been double-checked. The best tactic is total silence until you're absolutely sure what you found. Campbell orders Curtis to check his results again and again. As Curtis works in quiet isolation atop Mount Hamilton, Europe is in chaos. The order of Europe changed completely. We have three empires that disintegrate within weeks of each other. On November 9, 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates the throne. Einstein notes in his lecture book, class canceled due to revolution. In the immediate aftermath of the war, German scientists, including Einstein, are still not allowed to travel. But Eddington can. Einstein learns that he is going to Africa to photograph a solar eclipse expected on May 29, 1919. As Eddington leaves Cambridge, the hallways are full of crutches and canes. Cambridge begins to fill up with students again, but they're crippled or they're maimed. 
He had no fair and fair. He's heading off on a lonely adventure. Eddington believes in Einstein and hopes to bring back proof of his controversial theory. But in California, astronomer William Campbell is preparing to deliver his own results. And the news appears to be devastating. On two fronts and two continents, the proof of Einstein's theory now hangs in the balance. It's February 1919. Atop Mount Hamilton in California, William Wallace Campbell is examining and re-examining photographic plates, which appear to indicate that Einstein's general theory of relativity, his theory of gravity, is wrong. But Campbell has competition from British astronomer Arthur Eddington, who is on his way to photograph an eclipse in Africa. Eddington leaves Britain and heads south. He's in his late 30s. Travel in those days was not comfortable. This is the tropics, the height of summer. It must have been a very unpleasant place to be. In May of 1919, after 10 weeks at sea, Eddington and his assistant arrive on the shores of Principe, a small island off the coast of West Africa. Malaria is a big problem. There are poisonous snakes. He has to hack his way through the jungle. They spend a month building a telescope in the middle of the jungle. The day of the eclipse, rain is coming rolling down. He's crushed. Phenomenal disappointment. But then suddenly, amazingly, a gap in the clouds. He sees a black moon. They have to begin taking photographs right then. They have to start the device. The mirror begins to rotate, and then you put a photographic plate in the end of the telescope. It holds the film, and that plane has to be held with the telescope. Everything has to be aligned correctly. Take it out. Take out a new photographic plate. Put it in. Take it out. Put a new photographic plate in. And you try to get as many as you can. Tremendous race. But let's keep calm. Let's maintain composure. There's a great tendency to leave the lens cap on, to get the exposure incorrect, to make a fundamental error. That would then ruin your career. Time is uh, ticking away, the, the precious seconds. He doesn't really care about the sky going dark. He's looking for the star that's right there by the sun, grazing the sun. He's so busy working the telescope and switching out the photographic plates that, as he says it, he just had to do it in faith. He basically had to trust that something was going to appear on his plates. Like Campbell before him, Eddington is in for a crushing disappointment. He quickly discovered that most of his plates were worthless. The clouds have obscured nearly all the stars on every single photograph. But the very last few plates had just a few stars, which gave him some encouragement that he was going to be able to salvage something. You can imagine Eddington in this remote island, sitting down with a micrometer, a measuring machine, and looking, you know, this distinguished theorist, looking at these plates. His discipline is phenomenal. Now, to make these measurements, it's difficult. We're sitting here under this thick layer of atmosphere. Light comes from the distant reaches of the universe, and then it gets, like, jiggled and wiggled and smeared as it gets through the atmosphere. And the, by the time you're looking at starlight, which should be a pristine point of light, it's the smudge. It's a smudge. It quickly become apparent that it was going to be a much, much more difficult job. They're doing these precise measurements in the middle of the jungle. He can't wait to get back to Britain. Of course, it's going to take him months to get back. Einstein was waiting very anxiously. He was getting a lot of letters from friends and colleagues asking if any news was afoot. But relations between England and, and Germany were very, very frosty. And Einstein didn't think it would be at all appropriate for him to presume to write to one of these English astronomers and ask them what was going on. Eddington returns to Cambridge Observatory just as Campbell sails into London. Campbell is here to address the Royal Astronomical Society, an organization dating back to the age of Isaac Newton. He carries with him the secret results of his eclipse expedition of the year before. Campbell is the first to speak, and he was nervous because there were a lot of emotions flying about this, this test and a lot of reputations at stake. The anxiety must have been enormous because he's in front of all of his colleagues. There is that one moment 
The one moment that you stand before your peers. I don't think you ever really feel ready. Butterflies. <laughs> and then finally, Campbell announces his results. He said Einstein is wrong. And Lick Observatory says Einstein is wrong. But the session takes a dramatic turn with the reading of a cable from Eddington. His preliminary findings show just the opposite. The British were going to say that Einstein's right. Eddington still had more calculations to do, and it wouldn't be ready for a couple of months. But here we have this special meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society. Everyone's watching. Campbell says Einstein's wrong. The British say, we don't know yet, but it looks like he might be right. I mean, just delivered a death blow to Einstein. Campbell started to really get nervous sitting in that room. Campbell sends an urgent message to his colleagues back in America who were about to release their negative report on the eclipse photos. It was an historic cable of five words. Delay publishing Einstein results. Campbell. Four months later, on November 6, 1919, Eddington travels from Cambridge to London to address the Royal Astronomical Society. He has finalized his photographic findings on Einstein's theory. People come down from all over England to see what's going to happen. Everybody is, is shoving their way in there so they can see what the results are going to be. The portrait of Newton overlooking the whole ceremony. Had Newton been able to look down on this meeting, I think he would have been absolutely fascinated. Addington begins a meeting by pointing to the portrait of the founder of the Royal Society and saying, forgive us, Sir Isaac Newton, your universe has been overturned. The eclipse was partially obscured by clouds, but a few photographs of value were obtained. The secretary of the society records Eddington's results. The measurements of the plates have led to the conclusion that the deflection of 1 second 0.75 at the sun's limb, predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity, is verified by the eclipse observations. The public interest that gets generated by this is tremendous. Outside of the scientific community, no one had even heard of Albert Einstein, let alone his bizarre theories. Now the public learns that everything they believe about the universe is wrong. The Times of London says, in effect, there is a whole new theory of the world. Ideas we've known for hundreds of years are wrong, and this man, this German scientist, Albert Einstein, has given us a new truth. The New York Times has one of the greatest headlines. Men of science more or less agog over eclipse observations. Einstein theory triumphs. And it is then that the German press also picks up on, on these events. There's a, a Berlin magazine that shows him you know, sort of this, this romantic face with a, with a already fairly you know, dramatic hair, and this faraway look in his eyes. And then the caption to the cover of this magazine says, you know, a new figure in world history. Although few people really understand Einstein's ideas, Soon, everyone knows his name. Beers are named after him. Mothers name some of their children after him. Einstein himself never realized that his obscure theory of gravity would excite the public imagination. He says things are crazy here with the press. They all want an article. They want a lecture. They want photographs. It is all a craziness. This is, you know, one of the first great ages of photography. So there are pictures of Einstein. There are undersea cables. People can carry news all over the world. There are newsreels. You know, you can see the man moving and talking. Without such freedom, there would have been no Shakespeare, no Goethe, no Newton, no Faraday, no Pasteur, and no Lisa. But despite the public adulation, scientists still have their doubts about his theory. People are making a mistake. They're mistaking Einstein's fame for acceptance of his theory. You're equating the two, and that's very far from what happened. A backlash set in. In the New York Times, you can see that they were constantly, constantly questioning who is this famous scientist. Most uh, British people and most Americans, most uh, people from the Allied powers, were very hostile to Germany after the war. They were not at all interested in reconciliation. So many people were saying, 
oh, Eddington was so motivated by the goal of peace and promoting international brotherhood. He was so convinced by the theory that perhaps uh, he allowed himself to be a little bit biased. He's been criticized for fudging the figures. The photographic results from the two solar eclipse expeditions, Eddington's and Campbell's, result in a split decision. Another expedition will need to be mounted. Both Einstein, who has been trying to prove his theory since he first proposed it in 1907, and Campbell, who has been working on the problem since 1911, have tremendous personal stakes in the results. Now it was a matter of not just science, it was a matter of international reputation, it was a matter of personal reputation. This was personal. Campbell checks the charts and sees that the next best eclipse to photograph will be in Australia in 1922, more than two years from now. And it turns out he will not be the only one to take up the challenge. It's 1921, and the 42-year-old Albert Einstein becomes science's first superstar. Einstein has this sort of victory tour uh, of the world. In America, the newspapers are reporting as the boat goes across the Atlantic. Einstein is coming. So there are 15,000 people waiting to meet Einstein in Lower Manhattan. This is for a theoretical physicist. He traveled all up and down the East Coast through the Midwest. Einstein is a total phenomenon. But more importantly for Einstein, the scientific community is still debating whether his theory is correct. And the more attention Einstein gets, the more his theory is thrown into doubt. Einstein is being exposed to increasing criticism of his theory of relativity. People said, we have to redo the test. In September of 1922, a total solar eclipse will be fully visible in Australia, and William Wallace Campbell sees an opportunity to set things right once and for all. He started making plans to completely redo his equipment. Completely redesigned, redesigned entirely with this measurement in mind. This was the Cadillac of Einstein effect measuring equipment. The first eclipse point was the very, very, very westernmost part of Australia on a place called 90 Mile Beach. But this time, Campbell is not the only one pursuing this goal. Seven, count them, seven expeditions went to Australia. The British sent an expedition. Freundlich led a expedition. It was the first time he had a chance since Russia. John Evershed, a British astronomer, was able to come from India. The Canadians sent an expedition, and two Australian expeditions went. Serious competition to Campbell. The British and Freund Lake got clouded out. One of the Australians couldn't get any data. Their equipment was lousy. Poor Evershed from India had beautiful clear skies, but he had technical difficulties, so he got nothing. Campbell, now in his third expedition, is much better prepared. He gets perfect results. And they showed, I think, 92 stars that the Einstein effect was not only there, but it behaved as Einstein predicted, very clearly, very unambiguously. This is one of the lenses which confirmed the theory of relativity. Uh, the light actually passed through this lens and actually fell on this plate. This stuff is, is way cool. I mean, this is, this is the heart. The stars that could be seen around the eclipsed sun here highlighted, showed just the deflection predicted by relativity. They nailed it. Einstein was so right. It is a proud personal achievement for Campbell and a landmark moment for science. The Lick party finally succeeds, gets extraordinarily good results, and resoundingly corroborates Eddington's 1919 measurements. Now, who was the first person that Campbell sent a cable to with the result? Albert Einstein. He wanted Einstein to know, boy, did we vindicate you. Boy, did we show that Eddington was right, despite what all the scoffers are saying. For Einstein, this was a tremendous triumph. The eclipse expedition gives us amazing proof of something that looks theoretical, and yet it's very much part of our lives. They show that space-time around the sun was curving. It was a whole new way of thinking about 
how gravity works. How strange is that? That's completely against our intuition. But it's what the data showed, and you cannot argue with the data. Nature agrees. Yes, Einstein, that's a beautiful theory. You're right. Finally, 15 years after he first proposed his radical general theory of relativity, upending more than two centuries of scientific thought, Einstein is victorious and vindicated. Almost. The Nobel Committee rejected him in 1919 and in 1920 and in 1921 because no one accepted the theory of relativity. Einstein had promised the money from the prize as part of his divorce from Mileva and his support for his two sons. Mileva has resigned to the divorce, living with the boys in Zurich, waiting for the money from the Nobel Prize to come her way. She's actually relying on it. Now, it's not until 1922 that they finally announce his Nobel Prize. And one of the ironies, he never gets it for the theory of relativity. Instead, Einstein receives it for the first of his Miracle Year papers which describes the photoelectric effect. This work becomes the foundation for quantum mechanics and unlocks the secrets of the atom. To Einstein's former wife, Maleva, the prize means something more down to earth. She gets the money and she ends up buying three apartment buildings in Zurich. Maleva did not make a very good living from these investments, but she survived. For Einstein's cousin Elsa, who has nursed him through the bad times and waited patiently for years, there is also a victory of sorts. She has convinced Einstein to marry her. Great surprise. It was a strange marriage. Einstein had many lovers afterwards, and he never felt that this was sort of, you know, the perfect way of life for him. But she loved being Mrs. Einstein. She loved traveling with him. She loved the prestige and the glory that came from being his wife. As the world recovers from a horrific war, it embraces a man with the obscure occupation of theoretical physicist and turns him into a global icon. Here you have the end of the most destructive war in European memory. And here this pacifist saint comes along with a wild halo of hair piercing eyes, and people on all sides of the Atlantic, in Germany and in England and in America, could all celebrate him as a man of peace, but also somebody whose science transcended the horrors of war. That's where the emotional resonance of his accomplishment came, I think. And that's why People seized on him, not just as a smart guy, but as a symbol, you know, maybe an all-purpose symbol of what humanity can do well in the context of what humanity has clearly done so terribly. His story, the solo scientist who turns the world upside down, is enticing. Alone in his studio, using only his mind and a pencil, Einstein made bizarre discoveries as intriguing to the public as the most talked about music and movies of the day. They loved the mystery. Einstein himself said so. The fact that there are these wonderful words of the fourth dimension, bending of space, time warps, all that kind of thing. It's great. You know, light moves in ways you don't expect. These are kind of romantic ideas. These are, you know, mind-bending ideas. And people picked up on them in all kinds of ways. And it had this cool quality to it. He could see in ways that no one else could. He put together elements of the universe that others had not imagined would fit together. The general theory of relativity is one of the greatest achievements of the human mind. If you think about it, the entire modern age, the age of laser beams, telecommunications, satellites, that age was opened up by the work of Albert Einstein. For example, black holes and neutron stars and the Big Bang itself, you cannot describe them adequately without Einstein's theory of general relativity. It is beautiful and simple and profound. And all the best theories of the universe are just that. Einstein dies in 1955 at the age of 76. But more than a half a century later, the man and his theories continue to capture the popular imagination and to inspire. He was a man because of the power of his intellect, the sheer power of his mind, 
was able to rise above poverty, rise above war and strife, to become one of the great figures in all of human history. And that was an inspiration because you don't have to be born handsome. You don't have to be born with muscles. You don't have to be born that way. You can achieve it by the sheer power of intellect. And for me, that's always been a shining beacon. I think uh, most of the physics part, you, I've already talked to you about, so I don't think that they could have caused any problem. But if, if they did, then please do ask. That's not his paradox, but anyway, it's associated with time travel. Yeah, time travel. Einstein so, wasn't much bothered about that. Anyway, but tell me. So, in the, when we, in our philosophy, when we're talking about this, the effect and the cause and effect, so the cause and effect, when we going very precisely, there is a problem. For example, as a generally, we understand that the uh, opposite, if there is a cause, there is an effect. But the, uh, when we look very closer to this, uh, the how that happens, but there is a different uh, the possibilities to happen. But the, for example, when if there is no effect, which produces the cause. And the cause that produces the effect. And the, if there is no effect, there is no cause. But the no cause, there is no effect. For, like, for example, uh, when the hand, egg and hen, the which comes before. So, of course, generally we understand that the egg comes uh, the ladder because the, before the, without the hand, there is no hand without the. If there is no hand, there is no possibility of having the egg. But if there is in another thing, if there is no egg, there is no possibility of being. Yeah, I know. Ch comes. The chicken and egg problem, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which one comes yeah. first? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so what is the question? So then it's uh, when, the, when we're talking about the cause and effect, <coughs> cause and effect, so, if the, uh, the cause, so when we come to the way precisely, the, if there is no effect, there is no cause. If there is no cause, then there is the, no effect. So, but the, that the, we can't, the, the, uh, we can't. No, but so what is the question regarding the grandfather? Paradox. So, but the grandfather's paradox say that the, it is uh, possible to happen. I'm going back, but the killing the, to uh, this uh, possibility of that the, if the uh, future meets in uniform. <coughs> that is the yeah. in the Einsteinian world. Yeah. Yeah. If you can match properly, properly. then. So then you can't you can't kill because that's a yeah. contradiction. Yeah. Can't kill. No. But the, the, in the logical that is impossible. Why? You are the effect yeah. of your father. I mean, your father is your cause, and your grandfather is your father's cause. Yeah. So there is a time sequence, right, in which you come last, the grandfather, father, and then you. Now in time travel, you are going back to time, and before your father is born, you are killing your grandfather. Therefore you can't be there, because your father was never born, so how could you be born? That is a paradox. So people say this kind of thing cannot happen. find this uh, cause of this that cause and cause of that cause. Yeah, the cause was that you supposing you shoot him. 
or put a dagger into him, whatever it is. This, that detail is unimportant, but in some way you kill him. But if you kill him, then, then you can't be there to kill him. So that is a paradox. So you can't do it. That's the argument. But in the Einsteinian world, yeah. if you can, do, you may go back, but you will never be able to kill your father because you will miss him. If you shoot, you will miss him or your dagger, something. He can stop you killing. So that's still possible, that you can go back and no causal anomaly will happen. But that's a very special world you require in which this can happen. It can't happen normally. But Einstein's theory opens up the possibility of such things happening. Any other question? So regarding his life or whatever you saw today? Uh, according to the Einstein gravity theory, uh, it's that said that, uh, spe- uh, that the things fall down because they spe- Push it down. Uh, if it is so, then uh, when they. I mean, that is the way. That is the way this fellow, Michio Kaku, put it. This guy, Japanese guy, who was talking. His name is Michio Kaku. He has written some books called the Physics of the Impossible or something like that. But that's the way he puts it. But basically, it's like, supposing you have a piece of cloth, like this, you stretch it out, and you put a heavy object in the middle, then the cloth will curve around it. So exactly like that, if there's a very heavy object in space, space and time curve around it. And then everything goes in a straight line in that universe. Now imagine the surface of this, of a sphere. What is the shortest distance between two points on the surface of a sphere? Just two points. And take any two points and join the two points by various lines. Which is the shortest line? It's the arc. Now, the, looked at from a three-dimensional flat space, that's a curved line. But look at it from, supposing you don't know that there is a three-dimensional space, the whole space is two-dimensional. And the shortest distance, incidentally, the shortest distance between two points in a flat space is a straight line. And that's what a particle does. It goes in a straight line if no force acts on it. Exactly the same thing happens in the curved space-time. No force is acting on it. And it is going in the, along the shortest path. But in that space, the shortest path happens to be a curve. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, it means that space, space is not pushing it down, the things which is falling down. It's not falling down. It's just going in a straight line in that space. Yeah. Going along the shortest distance along that space, which is, has, there is a mathematical word for it. It's called the geodesic. It's just following the geodesic. Supposing you have a bowl, right? You take a bowl, a fruit bowl, and you take a, some ball, and you make it go round. Where, where will it go? It will just go round and round, because the space inside is curved. But of course, this, this uh, example is not quite right, because uh, you, can, you can say that there is still gravity trying to pull it down and all that. But forget it. If you, that is the kind of idea you, you have to have, that the space-time itself is curved. So one way of saying it is that if space is curved, it means it's pushing you. That's the way Michio Kaku put it. But I don't like that particular way of putting it. Basically, it's going along the shortest possible distance. That is just coasting along as if there is no force. Yes. But that happens to be curved. So if, 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 the, if, if the 
it's a cause of cough, then if the, when the airplane is flying, is it cough or not? Depends on what kind of space it is going through. If, if uh, supposing in the actual case of the earth, the aeroplane is flying, right? But if you, if it didn't fly, it would just drop. You have given it a velocity in this direction and the earth is also pulling it. That's why it's actually going like this, like, like a satellite. A satellite is going round the earth because the earth is pulling it. But what, how do you, how do you actually have a satellite? You just have, use a rocket to boost it up to a great height and then give it a push, big push, so much so that it doesn't fall on the ground. So it will keep going round and round, just like the moon is going round and round. But if the earth didn't pull it, it would just fly off. So one way of saying that, no, 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 the earth is not pulling it, the whole of space is curved, so that's why it's going round. So then I also heard that in the moon, the, the things uh, don't fall down. Is it true? If it's, it's is there no space? For no, 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 no. The, in the moon also things will fall down, but the acceleration that is, the sp you know, acceleration. The acceler acceleration means how fast the velocity changes. That will be only one fifth of what it is on the Earth. On the Sun, on the other hand, it will be much faster because the mass is much more, so the space is more curved. Space is very curved around the sun, not so much curved around the earth, and less curved around the moon. Because the amount of curvature is caused by the mass which is there. So, so this is why if you have a tremendously dense object, actually it's the, not the mass so much, it's the density, that is if you pack mass, into a very small volume and the density is tremendously high, then it can curve the space around it in such a fashion that nothing will ever escape, not even light, and that is called a black hole. And black holes are therefore predicted by... the Black holes you cannot explain from Newtonian theory, but black holes uh, are a natural consequence of Einstein's theory. And people claim that they have seen black holes, an immense humongous black hole at the center of our galaxy. So everything is being sucked in by that. Every galaxy has a, almost every galaxy has a huge black hole at the center. So all these things, and including the Big Bang, you cannot understand unless space-time is curved. And it changes. You see, given the static space and time, you cannot understand all this. But in Einstein's theory, space and time are not static. They are physical entities which interact with the masses to get changed. And their change then also changes the motion of the masses. So it's a dynamic thing. Imagine uh, you are acting on a theater. Normally, the theater doesn't affect you, right? Except emotionally. You're acting, you're going free. But supposing you find that the heavier the actor is, the theater itself gets curved, and then the actor's motion will also get affected. It's something like that. I'm just using an analogy. I think he made some such statement. Yes. yes. So uh, the question is that uh, why uh, why he uh, you know, why he made this such a, such a uh, important uh, statement and uh, what he sees in Buddhism that uh, what important thing that he sees in Buddhism. That I don't really know. Uh, which, uh, which, which perspective? 
you see i i have not studied his thoughts about religion so much but uh, there is now an archive online where all of einstein's writings are being put a friend of mine sent it the link to me yesterday so you can go and search and see what what he wrote but then everything will be german because he used to write everything almost everything in german um but yes i have seen this statement somewhere mm. you see i'm guessing buddhism as well as jainism of course are two religions which are not theistic there is no god of course in whole of indian philosophy and religion there is no creator god even in hinduism there is no creator god that is you don't believe that uh, the whole universe was created in a big bang this this kind of idea is very foreign to us because we always believe in in universal universality everything is is uh, been there it might change but to say that everything came into being at a certain point of time uh, i have not seen any evidence of it in any indian philosophy including buddhism but in particular buddhism it's non theistic and i think he saw that any religion which which is based on the concept of a personal god is going to have problems with science because gradually and gradually i mean science is showing such a thing just does not exist it's it, it's it's an anomaly i mean personal god in the sense it is understood by christians and and uh, jews it's not the same thing as we understand here in india or in china i think our concept of god is fundamentally quite different so that uh, it's completely consistent with any discovery scientific discovery you can make because this it says nothing about such details it, it, religion is has nothing to you see there the re- religion is linked to genesis the god created the universe in 7 days and then swan so came down as the son of god and he he preached and he was crucified and he was resurrected all these historical events become extremely important in the religion or you say no none of these things happened and then you fight now where in buddhism or hinduism or in other chinese philosophy where would you find this so much importance given to historical events nothing you don't say anything about it religion becomes something that that is very much personal and it is connected with ethics morality where science has nothing to say about that so the two can match one one, one need not be in contradiction with the other so uh, do you find any uh, similarity between the theory of relativity huh? do you find any similarities between the theory of relativity and the, uh, the 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 theory of interdependent in buddhism pratit <coughs> samutpad not directly but with some 
imagination one might be able to fit it but there is no directly anything like that except that causality is very strict in special relativity but then special relativity also makes causality much more precise than ever before it is connected with the speed of light and all kinds of things and uh, it says what kind of events can be causally related, what kinds of events cannot be causally related. Such things can be spelt out very clearly and precisely in relativity theory. Supposing something happens in the sun. Now no information can come from the sun to the earth instantaneously, right? This is relativity theory. It will take eight minutes, we know. Eight and a half minutes or whatever. So supposing something happens on the sun and before eight minutes are over, something happens here. Can you then ever say that this is the effect of what happened in the sun? No. Because there was not enough time for the for any information to come from the sun to the earth in that time. So this, this event is causally unrelated to that event. On the other hand, if something happens here after eight and a half minutes are over, then the possibility that this was caused by something in the sun is open. So in the first case, or if something happens exactly eight and a half minutes after that, then of course you can almost say directly that this is the effect of that. So there are three kinds, three possibilities. One is that these two are causally unrelated. And in special relativity theory we would say, that the distance between these two events is space-like. That is, it cannot be bridged by time. Or it would be time-like, uh, time-like, which means it's enough time for this to affect that. Or it could be light-like, that is, can be bridged precisely by a signal, light signal. So three kinds of things can be done in relativity theory. Space-like, time-like, light-like. And they define what's called a light cone and all that. But I don't want to go into that because this is getting into the technicalities of it, the mathematics of it. It's not necessary. But just to tell you that uh, causality becomes extremely well-defined in special relativity. But there is a distinction between causality and determinism. You know that? There's a, you know what is determinism? Yeah. One thing is determined by the other, or mutually determined. But causality is something where the concept of before and after time comes in. The cause must always precede the effect. Otherwise, you don't call it a cause, right? What happens in Buddhism? Do you, don't you have this idea that the cause must always precede the effect? Yes. yes but but uh, if, if, yeah? So when he the most stated that the the law of causality. So law of causality when we come to this, uh, he meet he uh, the, uh, give the example of this uh, seed. Seed. So he give the example of seed. So what? When seed. 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 Seed.
he shows that he is a particular Samad Pahatam Sutra. So when... Uh, what does he show? One, what does he show from there? So the, the particular Samad Pahatam, the effect, the, the cause should go, the precede. Yes, the yeah, yeah. But the, when uh, in the uh, Agarya, Ajarya Nagarjuna and the Madhinga philosophers, uh, the try to explain that. So how the the cause precede before the seed? Because when they, when we're talking about that, the without without negating the cause, there is no possibility of effect. So this uh, when if the, the if there is a time which negate the cause, there is no possibility this uh, the effect. If there is so that the, the the uh, the uh, uh, demonstrated by the um, the arguments which happened in the uh, Madhyamika philosophers. So very uh, one very tough this uh, argument because uh, this negation. No, I know it's a negation, negation of negation and all that. Yeah, I I, I know that. Yeah, yeah. With that that is they they are finally going to. Say that Shunya is the only, yeah, uh, yeah, it's the arguments, yeah, Nagarjuna's arguments. I know, I have gone through that. That's very similar to Zeno's paradox. Mm -hmm. Basically, Zeno wanted to prove the same thing. I, I can show you that, top, tortoise and the hare and the tortoise. Yes. You know, the hare is always faster than the tortoise. But if the tortoise is given, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, starts first, then the hair can never catch up, because same kind of argument. So finally, therefore, you say that there is no such thing as time. Uh, that's what uh, Zeno wanted to show that there is no change in this universe; everything is eternal. But it, but Nagarjun showed the other thing also that uh, uh, there can there can only be change. He 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 put it. He argued both ways. And then to sh say that therefore, Shunyavad. So last they show that this, uh, when this, uh, how happened this no. uh, cause and effect, huh. the, the cause produce the effect. Because the cause the negate, after that the effect. If cause is the negate, then there is no possibility of this having this effect. So then the, just by the showing that the subtle the, uh, concept is there, by example, example balance, by putting the two things and this balance, they, they go suddenly, immediately, up and down. So, so like this, the, the cause and effect happens. But that is still I, not clear how the, exactly the cause and the effect, and the cause, the uh, effect actually happens. No, so. Yeah. Well, you are going into the detailed mechanisms, but he, in, in relativity, there you don't need to go into any detailed mechanism. It's just a space-time structure which will tell you what is possible and what is not possible without going into the detail. That is the power of this method. I mean, whatever may be, you may be saying, negating and whatever, if the, if the distance is space-like, you just can't have. The two are, cannot be causally related. So this makes it very sharper, what you are talking about. But the actual mechanisms, it's a different story. Then you are going into a different realm. Relativity theory is a theory not of, act, not of actual physics, but telling you what sort of physics is possible and what is not possible. That's all. It gives you a condition. Because velocity of light is the same for all of us, therefore, physics cannot be of this kind and that kind. It can only be of a certain kind. That's all it is saying. But when you go to general relativity, it is actually talking about a particular phenomenon, which is gravity. And it shows that it, is, it, it has to be a theory uh, to be consistent with this fact that the velocity of light is a constant. Gravity has to be 
understood as curvature of space time and then we will see tomorrow how dramatically finally the bending of light around the sun was proved exactly and fortunately this time they already knew his corrected result which is twice what he had predicted earlier so if the Crimean experiment if world war had not intervened and they would have, and and the clouds didn't come they would have seen a result which would have contradicted Einstein it should have been double Einstein's thing and then Einstein would have been poo pooed out <laughs> he was saved so you know these are the historical accidents through which you go and then Einstein corrected it so this is the other thing that I mean even like an Einstein, man like Einstein can make mistakes that's not a very I mean uh, today somebody sent me some nice quotes and one of them was that uh, uh, if you fall down that's not defeat if you refuse to get up that is defeat so Einstein got up <laughs> and he corrected it <laughs>